This is the final episode of the series in which I'm going to be capturing targets. The following two will be me submitting my results, me reacting to the results, and whether or not I have, once and for all, been shortlisted for the Astronomy Photographer of the Year. But I am delighted to say that I have saved the very best till last, because we are going out with a bang. We're going to capture something tonight that is truly mind-blowing. I'm going to be using a super powerful remote telescope located in Chile, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm going to be placing my $500 smart telescope on my windowsill in order to capture the crab nebula and a very weird blurry point of light. Some of you may be able to figure out what that is already and if you want to take a guess then leave a comment down below. I'm Damon Scotting and this is Astronomical. So the first image I'm going to capture in this episode is going to be captured with this bizarre looking gadget. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you will know that I absolutely adore this telescope. It is the Seastar S50 Smart Telescope. I'm not going to say any more on it. If you want to learn more about it, watch the review on my channel. It's incredible. Now, because it only costs $500, I feel a bit more comfortable with what I'm about to do. And that is place it in a very risky location. Okay, let's open this up. Right, so I'm not actually going to be outside in the dark and cold stargazing. I'm actually going to be stargazing from up here in the warm comfort of my office because I'm going to be planting my Seastar S50 Smart Telescope onto this window ledge just here. Now, I'm sure this is going to divide you guys into a 50-50 grouping of those that think this is a smart idea and those that think this is just plain stupid. So I have just mounted a cheese plate onto the windowsill and then drilled four screws into it to give me this fairly sturdy uh, <laughs> this fairly sturdy camera mount. Yeah, I think it would do the job. The one additional benefit I do have to this is the fact that I've now got these gazebos down here, but also I suppose no my look, it's probably gonna bounce off the gazebo, spring up another 20 feet in the air, and then fall down onto the surface and basically crash and shatter into a million pieces. Uh, but positive thoughts, it's not gonna do that because we fought this through. It's securely fastened into this ledge. It's not supposed to be strong winds tonight and there certainly shouldn't be any rain, so it should be okay. Okay, so we've got a clear patch over here, but a not so clear patch over there. I don't know what it's like behind me, but that doesn't matter because the part that I need to be clear is clear right now. So I'm gonna jump straight into imaging. Here we go. image alone of the Crab Nebula is incredible. The fact that you can capture something like that with less than $500, phenomenal, okay? That's the bottom line. It'd be worth entering into the competition based on that fact alone. The entire image is compromised of one hour's worth of exposures. And I think it's incredible that this thing has zipped across that much of our night sky in such a short period. Yeah, I do toot the horn of this telescope quite a lot, but it's only because it's capable of doing so many incredible things that 10 years ago, I would have been spending every single waking second thinking of what other cool stuff I could do with it. Now that I'm older and I have this channel and I have the support of you guys watching, I'm able to afford more advanced equipment like like this. Even with this at my disposal, I'm still drawn towards using something like this because it's just so simplified. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I made a point, maybe it was in the trailer or maybe it was in the first episode, where I said that this competition isn't based on the expense of your equipment. It's based off the quality of the image and the story behind it. And being able to capture such an incredible event like this from your windowsill with a telescope that costs less than $500 is basically what being an amateur astrophotographer is all about. So undoubtedly, out of all the images that I've taken, this one is not the best, but I think given the expensive equipment and the actual quality of the image, it has like the highest ratio of like money spent amazingness of the image. I like it. I'm actually really proud of it. And the fact that any one of us could have just taken this outside, put it on the ground, got it started up within like five minutes and then image something like this is just, it's incredible. It's absolutely mind blowing. Now for the grand finale. This is the best image that I've captured in the last year and the most planning has gone into it. And that is due to the rare conjunction between the galaxy M100, otherwise referred to as the blow dry galaxy, and the dwarf planet 
series. But this encounter is even closer than the Crab Nebula and Vesta. So the story behind it is that I knew about this conjunction months in advance. The way I first found out about series coming very close to all these galactic monstrosities was because earlier on in the month of November, it actually came very close to the Leo Triple, which is a collection of three gravitationally related galaxies and they look very stunning. One of which is referred to as Hamburg Galaxy, which is kind of cool. It passed very close to that from our point of view here on Earth. But then a couple months later, it eventually performed pretty much a loop around all of these galaxies and then start heading on following very similar to its original path. So it almost takes a toll of this garden of galaxies and I think that's really special. And the thing is, you can get so excited and worked up over an event like this, but it will all mean nothing come the day because let's face it, in a location like England, you get on average one clear night every seven days, which means the odds of you being able to observe this event are actually quite rare. And I wasn't going to let my chances of observing this be down purely to look things I can't control such as the weather. So instead, I chose to book time on a remote telescope located under some of the most pristine skies on the planet. Now, I've said before that the spirit of the competition is to be able to capture stuff as an amateur astrophotographer, which ideally means that you're using your own equipment. But in situations like this, I really didn't want to miss out on such a rare event. I wanted to image it for as long as possible. I wanted to record series moving over the spiraling arms of this galaxy. And here in England, it was mostly cloudy across the entire country, which means it wasn't just me who was out of luck in terms of observing this rare event, it was basically everyone. So without the help, without the aid of a remote observatory, I would never have been able to capture these images for myself. And I think that's one of the strong points I'd use for arguing as to why remote observatories are good for amateurs to use. I'd say they're fantastic for looking at things that you can't see from your back garden because there is an entire southern hemisphere that has a sky completely different to what we're looking at right now. But also the ability to be able to capture rare events like this without having to worry about the weather is just indescribable. It really takes off a tremendous amount of weight from your shoulders. There's nothing you can do. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to use these remote observatories trees. If you'd like to check out the one I use for this video, Telescope Live yourself, then make sure you click the link in the description below and use this code because it grants you 50% off your membership and a free seven day trial. Let's now take a look at the images I've captured. I decided to keep the exposure time relatively short and only image in luminance. I'll then overlay each of these individual images over a colour image I took a few nights earlier. This should produce an uninterrupted series of series images showcasing the final stop of its grand galactic tour before disappearing behind the sun for another six months. And here we go. You are witnessing a dull grey rock less than a thousand kilometers in size outshine a gargantuan, spiraling starburst galaxy, 60% larger than our own Milky Way. The blow-dry galaxy is one quadrillion times the diameter of Ceres, the dwarf planet. For a few hours, which in terms of the universe is a cosmic blink of an eye, hundreds of millions of solar systems were obscured from our vision by this tiny piece of rock. This wasn't the first time I've captured the universe in motion, and it certainly won't be the last. My first image, showcasing our night sky changing, was taken 10 years ago, as a star in a cigar galaxy went supernova. I still had some credits to use with Telescope Live, and decided to make the most of this opportunity to recapture this galaxy in better detail than ever before. I also included its neighbouring galaxy M81, an edge-on galaxy that really adds some depth to this image. Now I did say at the end of the last episode that the galaxies category on the whiteboard was getting very full and there basically was no room left and because there is no room left I've decided rather than printing it out on a small photo I'm going to print it out on a format that is more fitting to the nature of this image. 
which is why for these two images that feature comets and dwarf planets, I'm going to put them in this category. But as for the third and final image, that is going to be its own printed poster instead, which is really nice. And since this is a high resolution mosaic image, you can make out a lot of detail in the cigar galaxy. So yeah, there we go. All of the entries have now been captured, which means all that's left is to submit them and wait for the results. The next job for me to do is to narrow all of these entries down to just 10 that I can submit into the competition. So in the following episode, I'll be doing just that. And it's going to be really interesting because I'm going to be talking through the process of how you do enter into the competition and some of the rules that they now have in place, including one very specific rule that I'm 99% certain has only been put in because of me. So we've taken a lot of images over the last year and we are now very close to the end. And we will find out the answer once and for all on whether or not I have been shortlisted for the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition. Thanks for joining me. I hope to see you again next week. I'm Damon Scotting and this was Astronomical.